Welcome back to Reality Asserts Itself on The Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay. We're continuing our series of interviews with Norman Finkelstein. Thanks for joining us again. Thank you. So all the biographies down there, and just I'm just going to plug Norman's book. His latest book is Method and Madness, The Hidden History of Israel's Assaults on Gaza. So as everybody knows, we do a lot of personal backstory before we get into some of the issues, and we're, we're going to continue. So we left off. Your parents had great loyalty, fidelity to the Soviet Union. You had kind of internalized the same thing um, and, and are arguing at school in defense of Stalin and so on. Uh, well, it ain't that much longer, I'm guessing. Well, you're a Maoist, and part of being a Maoist may be defense of Stalin, but it sure is critique of the Soviet Union, which your parents never accepted. So how did you get there, and what did that mean in terms of your relationship with your parents? <clears throat> I'm not really sure how I got there. I'd have to search my memory how I ended up a Maoist, but I can say as a general proposition, even though I attach a lot of value to ideas and the intellectual department of the human per personality, um, I want to see practical change. I want to see real lives improve. That was something I got from my parents. and so. In China, it seemed to be happening. There seemed to be real, genuine improvement in the lives of ordinary people. And I think uh, most of the evidence says in those early years there was. Yes, there was, but there also a lot of illusion. There was, but there was also a lot of illusion. And so uh, for me, it was the proof of the pudding. Uh, the eating is the, uh, the test of the Proof of the pudding is it's in the, the eating. eating. And there it was not a theory, it was a reality. We believed back then, or many of us, some of us who called ourselves Maoists, that human beings were genuinely being transformed, the new socialist men uh, putting, the, uh, putting society ahead of the individual, as Mao Zedong, the slogan was, to fight self. And uh, I, I believed all of that, I believed it with the whole, the wholeness of my being, I believed it. Uh, so for me, it was the practical fact that the lives of human beings were being improved and that a better world was not just in theory, but in practice possible. It was real. I mean, I was to the point, I remember when I was in college, I had a pair of work shoes like one of your camera persons is wearing now. And I was napping in the study lounge. I was a very hard worker, always reading, always studying. I took off my shoes. I went to sleep. And when I woke up, the shoes were gone. And it was winter, and I had to walk home barefoot. And I come to my class on China the next day, angry at the fact that my shoes are, were stolen. But what do I say? I said, this would never happen in China. I mean, that's how I saw China. It was, you know, God is great, God is good, let's thank us him for our food. This was China. China is great, or Mao is great, Mao is good, let us thank him for. And for people that don't know the period, this was not so unique. There were <laughs> no, Maoists all over the world. Uh, you know? No, it wasn't so unique. Now it's an era that's completely vanished. But back then it was not so uncommon. Even people like Shirley MacLaine were flaming Maoists back then. Uh, people will have forgotten. Actually, your listeners won't even know who Shirley MacLaine is. Uh, um, the Black Panthers were holding up the Red yeah, Book. Yeah, were marketing the Red Book. Um, so, but let uh, me go back to, I, I, to, go back that, to your parents, was, though, because yeah. to, to be a Maoist, you have to, you have to disengage from no, the Soviet Union. No, you, you don't really appreciate the capacity for self-deception. My parents were absolutely convinced that there was no split between the Soviet Union and China. <laughs> yes. They thought it was all made up by the CIA and the usual thing, you know, everything is the CIA, everything is a conspiracy. So, they didn't believe that Mao Zedong had denounced the Soviet Union <laughs> no, after Stalin. No, absolutely not. They didn't even believe that Stalin killed Trotsky. <laughs> nope. That's, uh, listen. You'd be surprised how Okay, much but what about you and your beliefs? Because uh, you'd grown up well, internalizing was, this was, uh, Soviet argument. Would, you, you knew uh, the Chinese yeah, were attacking yeah. the Soviet Union. Look, I was, an odd, I, I, I was a contradictory figure. 
because I believed in the ideology, but I attached too much value to intellectual life to believe it blindly. And so I always embraced the intellectuals who were Maoists. So I was close to Paul Sweezy at the time. The leading intellectual Maoist in the world was, nobody will remember his name now, but he was quite prominent back then, was Charles Bettelheim in Paris. I went to study with him. I read everything. I didn't read to learn. I have to be honest about that. I l read so I can answer any argument. I was looking for information, data, which would enable me to defend the cause. But I didn't really try, I didn't want to see if the cause may be flawed. I didn't read with that in mind. And there was no and skepticism. So, no, it was, we're arming for war, intellectual war, and I needed to, that was the books for the ammunition. I knew so much about it. I'm not boasting, I'm just, it's an element of fanaticism. Uh, I knew so much about it that in my undergraduate institution, I was the first undergraduate to precept the course on China, because I knew more than any professor. <laughs> I was a fanatic, but a fanatic in an odd sort of way. I it wasn't a fanatic in, sense, in the sense of being blindly wedded to a cause. I wanted to be intellect. I wanted to reconcile the ideology with the intellectual side of myself. And so, you know, for me, it may sound odd now, but Paul Sweezy, he went to Harvard. He was first in his class in economics at Harvard. He was in the same class as Paul Samuelson, the same class as John Kenneth Galbraith, and still he was the top. Uh, and then he was a professor at Harvard, and so he had all the conventional bona fides credentials of a scholar, and he was a Maoist. And for me, that was such a relief that you can function in the world of ideas you can be the top rank in the world of ideas and still share the same political belief as I did, which was a kind of eccentric political belief. So what happens? Mean? What breaks it for you? Oh, it's very simple what breaks it for you. It was um, the overthrow of the gang of what was called back then the Gang of Four. Which is Mao's wife. And oh, believe family. it or not, I know it's odd. I could tell you all their names. It was Jiang Jung Zhao. Uh, Wang Hong Wen, Zhang Jing, and uh, the other guy's well, name. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was devastated. Well, I wasn't devastated so much because I was wrong. How did that prove you were wrong? Oh, because everything was overthrown overnight. The whole Maoist system, which we thought new socialist men, they all believe in putting self, uh, putting uh, self second, fighting self. And then overnight, the whole thing was reversed. But there were other people which, which meant, kind of in your shoes. Which meant that the people weren't really that committed to it. Mm. And it also, it came out, there was just an awful lot of corruption. Uh, the people who we thought were absolutely selfless were very self-absorbed. Uh, so the, the, and it was clear, the, the overthrow of the gang of for had huge popular support. It's not like it was some midnight military coup. Everybody was thrilled at the prospect of ridding themselves of these ideologues as if they had now been freed from shackles. So, uh, as I said, it wasn't so much that I was wrong it was, I had made a fool of myself because I would denounce everyone who disagreed with me as being a bourgeois and a petty bourgeois. I remember I had a friend, his name was Roy Friedman, and his father, his father said to me once, Norman, before you get to China, there's going to be a McDonald's at the Great Wall. <laughs> and I just laughed at him. In fact, he's right. He was right. <laughs> but he, he said, oh, you're such a petty bourgeois. He said to me, you know, Norman, 
Why do you always call me a petty bourgeois? Why can't I be a bourgeois? <laughs> Make more money. <laughs> Why do I have to be a petty bourgeois? <laughs> but that's the, I was absolutely insufferable. I know it was because I look. I have a friend. Her name is Zena Rutkin, and she saved some of my postcards and letters. And she sent them to me a few years ago. I mean, <laughs> I cringed when I read them. Everything I dismissed with this all-knowing knowledge, you know. Marxism, Leninism was the science, as if I even got past chemistry in high school, but <laughs> the science. And we knew everything. We knew, uh, we knew where history was going. We knew everything. Uh, we knew nothing. Very foolish. You write that you, uh, you went, had to go to bed after you heard the news of the overthrow of the Yeah, I was in bed for form. three weeks. I was totally <laughs> devastated. Professor Bettelheim, who was the world's uh, um, most distinguished Maoist intellectual. He was hospitalized. Yeah, you don't know. But it shouldn't altogether surprise you. You know, many people think it was the McCarthy that destroyed the Communist Party. That's absolutely not true. You know, when you were a communist back then, you had the inner strength to withstand McCarthyism because it was the cause. What destroyed the Communist Party was Khrushchev's speech. On Stalin. Where, where, yeah, when people suddenly discovered they had been duped, they were fools. There were not an insignificant number of people who committed suicide. They gave their whole lives to a lie. It's even just true. Just for people who don't know, this it's is, even, this, if just it's, one it, sec, it, this is Khrushchev makes a speech in 1956, which are about the crimes of Stalin and this and is and as it happened, many people quit to communist make, parties. To make it topical, it was an Israeli who got hold of the speech mm -hmm. uh, because it was an Israeli member of the Communist Party of Israel who got hold of the speech and then distributed it. And uh, people, Communist Party people, were absolutely devastated. That's when they left the party in droves. So, but my, not your parents. Were your parents in the party? They were in the party because. But they never gave up on Stalin. So what I'm trying to get at is... Because they, because they never left the Nazi Holocaust behind them. I, 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 that, that was always, has been a perplexity in my life. Many people moved on. They were able to move on. I've never understood why my mother and father could not move on. It was... For my mother was clearly, uh, you know, every single member of her family, as with my father, every single member was exterminated. They were alone in the world. Um, and my mother was never able to get over that. Uh, I've met people like that, but I've never met people like that that didn't think of Israel as their salvation. No, they, my, my parents actually, I would say they... <laughs> I don't want to use strong words. Let's just say they dislike Israel with an intensity. Hmm. Let's go back to your three weeks in bed. Also because they were very sympathetic to the Palestinians. Originally, Palestinians didn't exist, but once they existed, and once the endless wars started, uh, then their, uh, their feelings of sympathy uh, with the Palestinians, you, you couldn't... Uh, it was an unusual home. You, you couldn't, in my house, was kind of like the first politically correct home on earth. You couldn't say anything, uh, you couldn't use, when I was growing up in my neighborhood, uh, I grew up roughly, roughly in the same neighborhood as, let's say, Charles Schumer, our current uh, US senator. He went to my high school. He was four years ahead of me. I knew his sister, who was one year ahead of me, Fran. And I knew the ambiance. It was so racist. You never called a black pe person a Negro. You called them a nigger, a schwarzer. That's how everyone carried on, except in my home. Impossible. I'm not saying my parents were saints, and I'm not saying they didn't harbor racist sentiments. They did. But you could never use pejoratives like that in my home. It was unthinkable. Um, that was um, all the legacy of the, of the war. Let, let me go. I want to go back to these three weeks in bed. Mm -hmm. It's not just Mao. I mean, mm -hmm. does not come kind of crashing 
a, an important piece of your whole identity, which was faith in the Soviet Union, Stalin, now Mao. Mm -hmm. It was a big piece of who you were. Yeah, it was a, not a big piece. It was the whole of who I was. I was, as I say, not happily, but I remember a friend of mine, a childhood friend, he's now the chair of the history department at Cornell University. He's a real right winger now. But he once said to me, you know, Norman, you become a bore. If you went into my room, I had pictures of Lin Biao, Lin Biao and Mao Zedong, the posters. Uh, socialism is advancing from victory to victory. Lo another poster, long live the dictatorship of the proletariat. It was so funny that once, it was New Year's Eve, and some nut just randomly shot a bullet into our home. It had no, no political resonance. My mother calls the police. So police come, so what do the police do? They want to look into every room. So of course, they have to come to my room. <laughs> they open the door. Long live the dictatorship of the proletariat. <laughs> Socialism is advancing from victory to victory. My mother looks at the police officer. Police officer looks at her, my mother, and she says, my son likes Chinese people. <laughs> 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 That's how she extricated herself. <laughs> but I was a complete bore. I was completely monolithic. Okay, so, so Some people still so think I'm a complete bore. <laughs> so. You're saying it was this, this identity is not a part of you, it was the whole of you. Yeah. So what's left after this three weeks? Who, who is Norman at the end of this three weeks? What happens? I got involved in other causes. I was involved with Central America. Uh, but nothing that totally consumed me anymore. I guess I was tired of ideologies. I was tired of theories. I was not a big uh, s fan of the Sandinistas. Uh, I went to Nicaragua at the time. I happened to have the misfortune of having gone there on the centenary of Marx's death, I think that week or something. I arrived the same day as the Pope. I remember that, but when the day the Pope arrived in Nicaragua, it was, e it was 82, I guess, <clears throat> or 84, maybe 84. And uh, all I heard was science of Marxism, Leninism, the science of Marxism, Leninism. I just, it rubbed me all the wrong way. I remember I was in one factory, I was working in a textile factory, just to get experience at the ground level. And one of the, uh, com one of the uh, militantes, as they were called back then, she calls over a worker and she says, this is our best worker. He's our best worker. I said, oh, really? What makes him our best worker? She says, oh, he does everything we tell him. <laughs> so said, uh, uh, I ain't going back there. <laughs> I mean, when I say I ain't going back there, I said, I'm not going back to my Marxist-Leninist phase. I was a nut. I went to Paris to study. You know what I did? I mean, it's just an embarrassment even to say it now. I spent the whole time in Paris. I read 25 volumes of Lenin. That's what I did. I brought over the collected works, which weren't not so expensive back then. because They were heavy. They, yeah, I, I had a, a roller. It was 55 volumes. I brought over all 55 volumes, yes. Because for me, it was not just, it was, a, it was an eccentric form of uh, uh, fanaticism. I had to grasp it intellectually. Or I thought I was grasping it intellectually because I was reading. In fact, it wasn't grasping it. So as, as you start to put together what amounts to a new identity, which I mm -hmm. guess has a big piece of it, not wanting yeah. to accept stuff blindly, yeah. when does Israel-Palestine become oh, your focus? I, I would say the big uh, influence, uh, the big influence at that time was Professor Chomsky uh, because he had the same, quote-unquote, radical view of the world but he prided himself in his works on being ideologically free. He said, just a little common sense, what he calls Cartesian logic. Look for the facts, and it's all you need. You don't need big theories. And as I said, I was theoried out okay. at that point. In the next seg segment mm -hmm. of our interview, we'll, we'll mm -hmm. pick up the story. And as you begin to focus your, your work on 
Israel and Palestine. So please join us for the continuation of our series with Norman Finkelstein on Reality Asserts Itself on the Real News Network.